Welcome LA Progressive friends, family, readers. Today, Dick and I are gonna be chatting with Michael Weinstein and I'm gonna let Michael introduce himself because he's got um, quite a resume of accomplishments and he's been active and engaged in, um, in helping to make this, this world a better place for a very long time. Michael Weinstein, talk to us about who you are and what you do. I'll say my activist days go all the way back to 1963, uh, 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 growing up in New York as a baby, uh, I was involved, <laughs> and then later in the anti-war movement, civil rights movement, um, but um, and uh, movement for LGBT rights. Um, but um, my most uh, recent career has been as the president of the AIDS Healthcare Foundation, uh, which was originally founded um, coming out of a campaign in 1986. Um, to quarantine people with HIV positive. Um, and then we then after that formed the AIDS Hospice Foundation to give people a dignified death. And when treatment started to improve in 1990, we became the AIDS Healthcare Foundation. Uh, then we expanded nationally when the cocktail came out, drug cocktail in 96, we became national. And then when I visited Africa for the first time in 2000 and was approached by activists for help, um, we went global. So now we are in 46 countries, 17 states. We are the largest AIDS organization in the world and we have uh, 1.9 uh, lives in care. Um, then um, six and a half years ago, we um, decided to embark on housing, um, partly because um, it was affecting our clients and our staff. Um, but most of all, because it was a moral outrage, similar to the way we felt in the 1980s about uh, when uh, people were dying in the hallways of the county hospital and we have the ability to do something about it. So <clears throat> there are two aspects of AHF. There's the Healthy Housing Foundation where we've been buying and rehabilitating, excuse me, hotels. Um, and we now have almost uh, 3000 units either uh, occupied or in development across uh, not only Los Angeles, but across the nation. And we have Housing as Human Right, uh, which is sponsoring the initiative that will be on the ballot in November, uh, Justice for Renters, which is uh, the ability to expand rent control in California. Wow. That's the long and the short. Well, so, can, can I just briefly, I just want to say thank you. Thank you, Michael, for the work that you've done, especially um, in the area of AIDS and providing um, people the kind of support they needed while they were dying. Um, so many people were impacted by that kind of support. I'm one of them. Um, many people in my family um, were impacted by that. The, the nearest and dearest person to me was my uncle who died in 1989 of AIDS in New York City. Um, but thank you. So go ahead, Dick and ask. Yeah, so, so uh, you and I and Sharon know a, a lot about housing as a human right, but I think maybe the uh, average person hears that and they say, well, well, how is that? How does that work? And so, what would the bill that's uh, trying to get on the uh, ballot in November? What would that actually do? Well, to start with, when we talk about housing being a human right, um, housing shelter is one of the most basic needs after food, you know, and security and clean air. Um, so, you know, we've treated housing as a commodity, right? And we've said the marketplace can take care of providing housing, right? And just in the same way that that hasn't worked with healthcare, it won't work with housing, which is, yes, um, you can have private players in the market, you know, uh, particularly at the higher end, um, but there will always be people um, who are disabled or elderly or on limited incomes who uh, cannot bear what the market price is. And that's why the government, it's very important for the government to be involved. Um, when it comes to rent control, uh, first of all, we've had rent control in this country for over 100 years. Um, it is not some, you know, uh, communist plot to, you know, uh, you know, it, it's been uh, part of our landscape for a very uh, long time. And, um, you know, when we talk about solving the housing crisis, it requires multiple approaches, right? Um, so, you know, we're not saying that rent control is the only answer. We actually describe it as three Ps, uh, prevent, um, preserve, and produce. The prevent is, uh, sorry, is rent control, which is to prevent people from be being displaced, right? 
We have to protect the people who are currently housed from not becoming unhoused or, or being so rent burdened that they have to choose between rent and food. Um, to preserve is to preserve communities. Gentrification is a really big problem in most of the major cities, but particularly here in California. And the producer is we need more housing, right? We need more housing at different income levels, but we especially need it at the lowest income level. We don't have a shortage of $5,000 a month apartments in Los Angeles, right? We have, we have a, a shortage of, of ones that are four or five or $600 that people can actually afford when they're in disability or social security. So in, the, um, in 1995, a law was passed called Costa Hawkins in California. And that bill basically severely restricted localities cities and counties from expanding uh, rent control. It froze in place um, 1995 um, as a year um, where private homes couldn't be included, um, where various restrictions were there. But in addition to that, it said if you already had rent control, like San Francisco and Los Angeles, it froze it in, the place, in place in the year that it was created. So in Los Angeles, it froze in place 1978. So nothing built after 1978 is covered uh, by our rent control laws here. And this uh, big real estate, the billionaire real estate industry, they went across the country and passed these laws in 34 states. And one of the sponsors of that bill was a Democrat, uh, Jim Costa. So every single year, we or somebody else introduces a bill to um, repeal Costa Hawkins and return the ability of localities to enact rent control. And every year it dies. Most years it doesn't even get a hearing. Uh, this is in a, a, a super majority democratic state. But the legislators, first of all, um, only five of them are renters. 25% of them are landlords and virtually all of them get money from, from big real estate. So it's been impossible at that level. So twice before, um, in 18 and, and 2018 and 2020, we had uh, issues on the ballot. Um, and in both cases, in the early polling, overwhelmingly uh, popular. Then uh, the industry dumps $100 million on uh, it, with, with lies and misrepresentation and spreading confusion. And we wound up in both cases a little over 40% of the vote. The situation has gotten so much worse in these intervening years. So uh, we hope and we believe that the third time can be the charm, but that can only happen if progressives are united in putting this at the top of the priority list. Um, and you know, we have 17 million renters in California. The majority of them um, are on limited incomes and the majority of them um, are paying more than 30% of their income in, in rent. The first apartment I had in Los Angeles, I paid $100 a month for including utilities, right? Um, I was making you know, $500 a month. And so I could live, I was okay. It, was, it wasn't fancy, you know, it was just adequate, but it, it was okay. Um, and you know, I grew up in a rent control department in New York. Uh, Bernie Sanders and I both have that legacy of uh, Brooklyn boys, Brooklyn Jewish boys who I grew up in um, projects in, in the Bronx. So I uh, absolutely understand the need for, um, for rent that is either controlled or subsidized for working families. Um, there was, there's no way that my parents who were teenagers could have been able to provide housing to us kids. But you said a couple of things, Michael, just now that I, I want you to expand upon. You mentioned these billion dollar developers who went across the United States um, getting legislation passed. And, and so often I feel like our readers don't get it. They don't understand that um, powerful interests literally are writing legislation, having it passed. And then the second point you made was that in 2018 and 2020, we had initiatives here in California on the ballot to get rid of Costa Hawkins. And it looked like we were going to pass. They were overwhelmingly uh, po popular. 
And then those same deep pocketed interests threw millions at it and we and we didn't pass. So those two points really point to out how and why it's so important for progressives to be engaged, to read, to understand, because they, they're so impacted. But go ahead, you respond to what I've just asked you. Sure. We have to hold our elected officials accountable, our you know, liberal, progressive, you know, uh, accountable. Um, we need to make this big real estate money as toxic as tobacco. Um, you know, we have to, we have to, you know, uh, we need to have legislators, you know, progressive legislators declare that they will not take real estate money, right? Um, so um, that's one one uh, piece of it, right? Um, we also, though, you know, we were we all had the privilege of participating in the Sanders Institute uh, gathering uh, this week. Um, and one of the things that I have been uh, pushing hard for is to raise this, as I said, up on the progressive agenda. And both uh, Congresswoman Jayapal and Bernie uh, said that um, they felt that it had not been, it should have been at the top of the list and hadn't been as high as, as it could or should have been. So that's very hopeful to me. You know, we have a lot of very important progressive issues going to be on this ballot in November. We have uh, the right to abortion. We have um, same-sex marriage. We have... Uh, a bill that would make it harder to raise revenue that's being pushed by California Business Roundtable. Uh, we have oil uh, drilling in residential areas. Um, we have the minimum wage. You know, a lot of times we have a particular interest in a particular issue, and that's great, right? But if we're going to win against the hundreds of millions of dollars that will be spent against us on these progressive issues, we have to be united. We have to come together. Um, so I, I made that appeal this week, and I hope that call will be um, be answered. Um, but um, I mean, um, you think about how bad it has gotten, housing situation has gotten over just the last ten years, right? And if we don't do something to give relief to people, uh, you know, not only are people um, becoming uh, homeless, not only are they um, you know, paying huge amounts of money, but so many people live with that anxiety about where will I live? Where will my children live? Right? And we can't treat housing as a commodity. It's a necessity. And, um, you know, one unfortunate thing is that a lot of Democrats, even liberal Democrats, have embraced this trickle-down idea when it comes to housing, right? They rejected it when it was Reaganomics, but they're embracing it when it comes to housing. Basically saying, you know, just build, build, build. You know, we need more housing. We Everyone agrees on that. But what's being built is primarily luxury housing. And very little of it is at the low end, right? Um, and therefore, you know, I say that um, it doesn't matter how many Ferraris you build if all you can afford is a Chevy. Um, and those buildings remain empty. There's a glut of luxury housing in Los Angeles, right? Um, but those... Uh, speculators, they'll keep them empty as long as they need to, right? To hold up the value of that of that property. And unfortunately, our city council in Los Angeles keeps approving these projects without requiring those developers to have a portion of those buildings, significant portion of those buildings, be available to or for housing. So um, this horrible tragedy, the shame of 70,000 homeless people on the streets of Los Angeles or Los Angeles County. It didn't happen by accident. And it started well before Costa Hawkins. I, I know when, when I came out here in the 70s, late 70s, there was a skid row and I spent time in Venice and there was some homelessness there. But it was when, when you and your colleagues did this wonderful work of starting the AIDS Healthcare Foundation in the mid 80s, that, that homelessness blossomed. And I can remember going downtown and, 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 and I didn't go downtown much at that point and be shocked to see the homeless people in the mid 80s, late 80s, lined up five deep on the sidewalks around Skid Row, but outside of Skid Row. And, and I, I, I think a, a part of it is, you know, we were, some of us, not probably the three people here, were sold this bill of goods that the only good government was one that's small enough you could 
drowned in a bathtub and that you shouldn't be looking to government for solutions. And I have to say that I, I think that's a part of, and, and that, 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 that philosophy never died, that it ebbed and, and waned, but now it's back. It is kind of what's going on in our world, at least in part of our political sculpt, uh, culture. Um, how, how do you think that? How how did how do you feel that homeless came to be such a tragedy? Well, I think first of all we have NIMBYism, right, which is people who are opposed to having affordable housing in their communities, right. I think sometimes. Those of us who are anti-gentrification are sometimes classified as NIMBYs, which is, I think, is not accurate, as unfair. So that's one big piece. There's also the legacy of racism. There was a thing called Article 34 that was passed, which basically uh, obliterated public housing, said that any public housing had to be approved by the voters, right? So that's going to be on the ballot as well. And we are contributing financially, and we're going to work on that to get that, that repealed. The other piece is um, the disinvestment on a federal uh, level in, in housing, right? Um, I mean, the projects and everything that was, I grew up right down the street in Brooklyn from, from project. I went to school with kids who lived in the projects. Those were nice places to live. They weren't fancy, but they were nice. They were adequate. They, they gave people safety and community, right? Um, so we stopped investing in those. And we, we started saying that public housing is a failure. Public housing isn't a failure unless you don't provide security and you don't make repairs. And, and you let it become gang infested. Um, but the last piece is, the most important piece is corruption. You know, we have a tradition in Los Angeles as an example, whereby um, developer goes to the city council person, right? And says, I want an exemption to build something that's three times as, as high, as big as, as what I'm allowed to build. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna build it just for, the." The top end of the market. And, you know, they give contributions to the council person, et cetera, right? So that council person then puts forward a motion and it gets approved unanimously in almost every single case, right? Um, and the whole explosion of corruption that's resulted in all these indictments is be mainly because of that. Mainly is that, you know, if, if a wealthy speculator owns a piece of land that's worth $10 million, right? And then they get permission to build something three times as large overnight. It's worth thirty million dollars. They've pocketed twenty million dollars, right? Um, that has to change. First of all, um, they have some limitation on development for money. It should be a hundred percent. They're doing that kind of business with the city. They should not be involved in political campaigns at all, right? Um, but in addition to that, um, we have to have council people not rubber stamp. Like everyone is not a prince or a princess of their district, right? In other words, like if 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 I if I vote for yours, you'll vote for mine, right? Um, that's been been a terrible um, precedent. But another issue is is that what's difficult is that the tenant's voice has been very very weak, right? It's it's very poorly funded, right? Uh, and um, you know, renters sometimes are transient, so they don't feel as much of a, they're not as engaged necessarily in, in communities, um, or they're poor and they're struggling with daily existence, right? Um, so you, it's, it's not a fair fight between the renter, you know, housing justice people, and uh, the in big real estate. They dominate. And building out the, the renter uh, movement is extremely important. We've had some success in that regard. There was a bill passed in Sacramento called 1482, and it was a rent cap, rent gouging bill. And everybody said, um, this is not rent control, okay? The, the big real estate decided to endorse it. And they said explicitly publicly, this is to stop the initiative on rent control because 1482 allowed them to get up to 10% increase. And suddenly what was um, the cap became the floor. Every, uh, uh, the owner said, well, I should go for the for 10%. You know, I don't want to, you know, get limited in the future. So I'll, I'll get it while I can. Mm -hmm. Um and that and then what and that took place during COVID and, and the, the rents have skyrocketed. What does a 10% increase on an apartment mean to somebody making $1,200 a month? 
I mean, it's the difference between, you know, uh, splitting pills in half or, or not having food uh, to eat all the time. Yeah. So um, when we look to solutions, the one area that Dick and I try to focus on is the media, is um, educating and informing the progressive community and those who don't who aren't quite sure what they are, whether they're progressives or they're moderates or whatever. How can we support independent media? Because the media is not really um, delivering the messages that we need delivered. First of all, I mean, um, the Los Angeles Times, which is, you know, kind of been in a downward spiral, uh, their biggest advertiser is real estate. When, when you pick up that paper on Saturday, there's that huge section, right, uh, of the, uh, you know, uh, $5 million homes, right? Uh, my aunt always loved flipping through that. Uh, she gets such a charge out of it. But um, so we can't rely on the LA Times, right? And the LA Times is is Yimby or Yes in My Backyard or Build, 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 regardless of whether it serves people who need it the most. Um, I mean, first of all, I salute what you do. I know you do it. It's a labor of love and I know that it's not easy. So I salute what, what uh, you're doing. And I think that What's so valuable about LA Progressive is it gives, it's a forum for people to express their ideas. Everyone doesn't have to agree with them, right? Um, but it's a place and there are so few places like that. And that's also something that was so wonderful about the San Diego Institute gathering, right? It was a chance to, uh, in a very relaxed setting, you know, talk about solutions, talk about uh, the nature of the problem and, and, and compare and contrast ideas and uh, just network among people uh, who, who you know, believe in helping the most people we can. I mean, that's what being a progressive to me is all about, is helping the most people you can, right? Uh, uh, now and into the future. Um, and for a lot of people, particularly younger people, um, housing is, is a higher priority to them than healthcare. I mean, I'm all about lower drug prices. I'm all about Medicare for all, but, What's the most immediate thing for a lot of people is whether they can pay the rent on the first of next month, right? Um, so I'm, you know, optimistic coming out of this week because I saw that that um, many many more people are realizing the centrality of the, uh, the housing issue. And Ajaya Paul is an example. I mean, she gave a very intelligent explanation about why it uh, kind of hadn't clicked the way the way it should have or could have. Um, but I think you already uh, provide a forum for a bunch of housing uh, and tenant rights activists to, uh, you know, share their um, their views. And I hope when you do interviews with, you know, some of the political leaders that you do, you know, you'll 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 uh, ask them some tough questions on on some of these uh, issues. Thank you so much, Michael. Um, Dick, did you want to ask anything else before we close? Well, I, I wanted to comment on, on the wonderful Sanders Institute gathering as well. Uh, as, as Michael says, I mean, there were the big names. There were uh, Gavin Newsom and Karen Bass and, and Roka Hanna and, and obviously Bernie Sanders were speaking. But there were also, you know, there was a couple of people in blue jeans and rolled up shirts who were putting houses out in the desert for to house homeless people. And a lot of the people in the audience had had decades or years of experience of working with the homeless. And I thought I thought that was valuable to get the, the conclave of ideas and make the connections among people. And and you had a, a fairly significant role in pulling that off, uh, of helping the Sanders Institute. Oh, so, uh, right? you know, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, the, the last time they had the gathering, it was in Burlington, Vermont. It's, it's kind of a different world, Burlington, Vermont. and. <laughs> Yeah, big city of Los Angeles. Uh, so uh, we hosted the event um, and we staffed it. Um, but it was it was you know it's amazing when when uh, when Jane Sanders picks up some, picks up the phone, uh, people answer it and uh, they show up and it's a tribute to the influence that Bernie continues to have uh, in California. There were several very young people who have been elected to offices. Uh, as uh, the mayor of South San Francisco, Alex Lee, who's an assemblyman, uh, several others, and they all uh, uh, were birthed out of the uh, Bernie uh, movements in, in 16 and uh, and um, 
and 20. Um, yeah, Carol, the, Carol Fife, who really delivered um, a particularly moving presentation from Oakland, who was an elected. I think she's on the Oakland City Council. Right. It was terrific. Um, so, you know, you're always hope, and I look back on events like this week, where you say, you know, things germinate out of it, right? I mean, it's like, you don't know exactly where it's going to go, what it's going to mean, but just, you know, that, that some vital connection was made between individuals or some idea got uh, spurred along. And uh, uh, I, I mean, I'm, they're going to have a session in Burlington coming up uh, in the next few months. I'm looking forward to going to that. And uh, I think, you know, the more we can foster um, respectful, um, considered, you know, conversations. Where we're not just hurling things at each other, but we're actually listening and uh, engaging. Um, you know, I think that's uh, very vital for our movement. Thank you for sticking around. If you like the LA Progressive content and the discussions we have here, please consider clicking the subscribe button below and also give us a thumbs up. That helps to grow our audience by feeding the algorithm, which helps to get this content in front of more eyes. Thanks for stopping by. We really appreciate your support.